medieval era has always fired my imagination. A world of legend, knights and castles. A time of jousts and heroic battles. But it was also a time of building, a time of change, and a time of innovation. My name is Mike Lode, and I've spent my life trying to understand the past by experiencing it. I'm an historian who believes that when you get your hands on the past, you discover what a surprising place it was. A world with familiar challenges, but very different solutions. I'm going on a journey to explore the medieval world. A world that spanned a thousand years, from the fall of the Roman Empire to the Renaissance. Fly! I want to get as close as possible to the everyday lives of ordinary people. And to take part in the pursuits of the nobility. I'm going to experience what it was like to live in this fascinating period of our history. Some of it will be everyday details. Some of it will be spectacular. It will all be 100% authentic. Clear! I'm going medieval. I'm focusing on the 1200s and 1300s, which for me is the high point of the period. And I'm starting with a classic image, the castle. Early castles were weapons of intimidation and attack. They weren't just about defense, and they weren't made of stone. The first castles were like this, on high mounds with wooden towers surrounded by a wooden palisade fence. In fact, they were very like the American forts of the 1800s. And that's what they were. They were cavalry forts. And they came into being about a thousand years ago with a new type of warrior, the knight, a horse-born warrior who rode a proud, spirited war horse. And war horses need feed, they needed shelter, they needed veterinary care, they needed a base. And these bases were aircraft carriers for horses. You'd deploy your fleet of wooden castles deep into enemy territory as you pushed ever forward into lands of conquest. And from here, I can control the land for 10, 15 miles, the land that I can send a patrol out and get back before nightfall. But who were these knights? The popular romantic image is of the knight in shining armor who spends his time jousting and wooing ladies. There is some truth in that, but first and foremost, a knight was a soldier. The cult of knighthood was centered and founded on the elite horse-born warrior. First weapon of attack was the lance. Knights were shock troops, smashing their way to victory with the impact charge. But knights, especially in England, fought as often on foot as they did on horse. A group of my friends, all experts in a range of historical skills, are going medieval with me to help me uncover the reality of the medieval world. Knights were the military elite, and that didn't change whether they fought mounted or on foot. Above all else, they were crack troops, and that meant constant, hard training. The training was exhausting. The French knight Boussicot said you should run at least a mile a day in your heavy mail shirt. Knights trained every day to accustom themselves to the grunt and sweat of wearing armor. This is the pell. This stout wooden post is the medieval equivalent of the boxer's punch bag. They're working the pell with wooden swords. Many of the texts tell us that the wooden swords would be double the weight of the steel sword. So this is not an easy option. This is to build up your strength and your stamina. 
In battle, fighting was hard, vicious and brutal, and knights, tough fighting men, fought with every means at their disposal. They're using their shields to fight with. For body checks, they can use them with the edge of the shield. But, of course, the shield on the battlefield is really there to protect you against archers. That's why you're really carrying this. But in tight press of men, it also becomes a weapon. Knights trained hard to master a range of all-in fighting techniques. Wrestling grips and holds were an essential part of medieval sword fighting. <laughs> Gripping the blade to use the sword at half sword. From here, I can pull his sword out of the way, I can go for his face, smashing his teeth out, or I could trip him with the cross guard. <laughs> What would happen in a battle is the crush of men from either side squeezes you in. Then we're pushing them back. They're getting closer and closer, and eventually they're in a tight melee. And finally, they have no choice but to fall to grips and grapples. Wrestling techniques were of particular use when knight came up against knight on the battlefield. They had their own code of honor, chivalry. And my sparring partner, Dr. Tobias Capwell, is an expert in the rules. Knights are fighting other knights, other equals of the same social class. And within the Brotherhood of Chivalry, you don't necessarily want to have to kill your social equals all the time. You have the process of ransoming. You can force them to yield to you. They become your prisoner. And then you can sell them back to their family for an extraordinary profit. But they're not going to yield easily. You've got to defeat them, but not kill them. See. Now, I've got you in an arm-breaking position. Yeah, he could break my arm. And I can make I can it... feel that he can break my arm. I can make it worse and worse well, until... I yield. In. And then I give you my word, I yield, I am now your prisoner, you can let me up. Fine. <laughs> Chivalry works with people of the same class. Of course, if he doesn't perceive I am his same social class, then chivalry doesn't work and he drops me to the dead. Knights were icons of the medieval age, but an equally powerful image was the castle. Castles conjure up both the romance and dread of the period. Merci, Thierry. But I'm not just going to look round an old castle. I'm going medieval to help build a new one. This is Guédelon in France. A small team of experts are 15 years into a unique project. They're building a full-size medieval castle from the ground up. There's nothing else in the world like it. These craftsmen use only authentic materials and medieval building techniques. There's no electricity, no power tools, no dump trucks. Everything is done by hand, exactly as medieval builders would have done it. Bonjour, Clément. Bonjour, monsieur. Ça va? Bienvenue à la carrière. Merci. Because all castles start here. They start with the stone. They start in the quarry. Even quarrying the stone uses nothing but traditional techniques and hard labor. Once the stone was quarried, it was shaped by stonemasons. The chief mason was the most important person on any castle building project. He was the architect, builder, designer, craftsman and engineer, all rolled into one. Below the mason was an army of tradesmen, maybe up to 200 men on a castle this size, making everything from the wooden scaffolding poles to clay roof tiles and mortar, all from scratch. Here they're making the mortar, the stuff that binds all the stones together, a mix of earth and sand, lime and water. Come, sir. Here we are. Castles were at the heart of the community. Everyone passed through these gates from peasants to princes. 
It's taking 45,000 tons of stone to build this castle, and it all has to be lifted using nothing but muscle power. So how do they get the stone to the top? The answer is a remarkably advanced crane that can lift as much as many modern construction cranes. This is the most ingenious mechanism. This double drum tread wheel actually has the capacity to lift two thirds of a ton. It's two of us working these wheels. It's walking away like hamsters. It's no different to walking on the treadmill at the gymnasium. You can see the huge payload of rock that we're lifting up. Now, the whole thing is swinging round. This pallet of stone is being swung into position, and we're now lifting it up to the masons on the upper level. Guédelon is based on an 800-year-old French castle design. When it's finished, it will have six towers, a great hall, and high walls enclosing more than an acre of land, all surrounded by a huge dry moat. This is the top of the Lord's Tower, laying this mortar to put in the next stone. But if you look at this stone, you see the detail and attention to this construction. There are all these mason marks on here. First of all, there's an arrow, which is telling us that this is the way it should face. That's the name of the man who made it, the man who cut this stone. And this is the measurement of it. In Roman numerals is the figure eight, telling me that it's eight inches deep. I think I'm gonna need your help. Eight in one, so we tip it up like that. OK, there we go. And that is now hanging true, and that stone is perfect. And I have built a little tiny bit of Gaydelong Castle. This was precise engineering, creating buildings that would last for hundreds and hundreds of years. Castles remain a majestic sight in the European landscape today. Coming up next, I'm going traveling, and I'm going to see what happened when they caught a medieval rogue trader. I'm Mike Lodes, and I'm going medieval to show you what life was like 800 years ago. It's a medieval journey that's full of surprises. With few decent roads, by far the best way to transport heavy goods was by ship. The seas of Europe were full of these trading vessels. Cargo ships like this, which are known as cogs, were the workhorses of the sea. A single-masted vessel with very heavy sails and very broad, flat-bottomed boats. This meant they could carry a great deal of cargo. These decks could be full of timbers from Scandinavia, furs from the Baltic, or even just bringing cattle and livestock from one end of the country to the other. Now the sail has picked up our wind and we're moving along at really quite a clip. These ships were so popular that by 1300, the Kingdom of Denmark alone had a fleet of over 1,000 of them. The distinctive feature of the cog is that the steering rudder, the helm, is centrally mounted at the back. On earlier ships, it was on one side, where it was called the steer board, the steering board. And of course, that's where we get the word starboard. And of course, if you've got your steering mechanism, your starboard, on one side, you can't go into port on that side. So you went into port on the other side on the port side. The shallow drafted design meant that you could dock these ships in any port throughout Europe. So any little coastal town could take in international trade and be a gateway to the wider world. Yeah, hey, 
This wonderful place is the medieval center in Denmark. It's an authentic replica of the sort of little port town that you would find all over Europe. This place is a living history museum where everyone goes as medieval as possible. As you see, there's goods from all over the world here. Furs from the Baltic, there's wonderful wooden goods, pottery goods, clothing. Okay, I'm handsome in this. Yeah, I'm very handsome. Yeah, it's a good look for me. I haven't a clue what they're saying. I'm sure they think I look lovely. But the point is they're speaking Danish, so I don't understand them. But that would be a real problem for the medieval traveler, not just traveling internationally, but in his own country. Regional dialects were almost like different languages, so that the traveler from York would find it very difficult to make himself understood in London. The man from Marseille would be incomprehensible in Paris. Another problem in the marketplace was making sure you didn't get cheated. Traders who tried to fleece the public, either by inflating prices or selling short measures or passing off cheap imitations, were publicly shamed by being placed in the pillory. There's an account of one Robert Porter in 1387. He was a baker, and he had put iron weights into the loaves of bread he was selling to make them weigh more. He was put in the pillory, and the iron weight was hung around his neck. And the loaf was hung around his neck. So there could be no mistake about what he'd done. As if that wasn't bad enough, you had to endure the abuse of your neighbors as well. They throw rotten vegetables, stinking fish, rotten eggs, animal dung, anything they could find. And he was there for several hours. And in a small community, this public shaming had a great effect. This was the equivalent of being on the front page of a tabloid newspaper. Pillory wasn't the only punishment. Thieves could be branded on the face or the hands, so the world could see their crimes forever. The idea that medieval Europe was dull and gray is quite wrong. In fact, it was vibrant with dazzling color. And in order to put that color in their clothes, they used a surprising ingredient. What um, we will be using is, in fact, stale urine produced by a man. And it's got to be a man, and it's got to be stale. So, so, so that, how, how, how old is this urine? This, this is a month. Julia Clark is an expert on medieval dyes. Wool and cloth were dyed with vegetable dyes, and for some colors, urine was a key part of the process. When it goes... We're now adding the stale urine of a man into the mix. In London, in the 1300s, there were buckets on street corners for men to deposit their urine, which was then collected and taken to the local dye works. It's the ammonia in stale urine that fixes the dye, but modern science hasn't figured out if it really had to be a man's. The medieval world was a handmade world. Everyday needs were labor intensive, and everyday goods were made not in mass production factories, but by home workers with artisan skills. Even the basic task of lighting a fire was a real art. When the sun went down, you might think that medieval life stopped, but that would be to underestimate the power of firelight, candles, drink, and good company. This is a tavern. It's not especially welcoming to out-of-towners, not welcoming to strangers. For that, I would need to go to an inn. That's where a traveler would find food and lodging. A tavern is for the local community. Here, everybody knows everybody else. This is their local meeting place. I'm an out-of-towner to them, so I'm going to sit here on my own. Taverns were so popular that in the 1300s, London had three times as many taverns as it did churches. 
This is quite a respectable establishment. Uh, having said that, it is where people would come to seek prostitutes, and you can tell them because they wear yellow hoods, a very distinctive trademark. Light and heat is expensive in the Middle Ages, and a tavern gives free light and free heat for people to come together. This was the center of the community. Cheers. <laughs> Getting from place to place on land was simple. You either traveled on foot or used horses. And if on horseback, you used a special type of horse. These are medieval traveling horses. In the Middle Ages, people used different horses for different purposes. These are not war horses, they are for travel. And they're very distinctive for this traveling gait. It's called the amble. Modern horses have four gates. They can walk, trot, canter, and gallop. But these horses have a unique fifth gate. This is the amble, and it's a very fast walk. I'm going medieval on these horses with Toby Capwell and Gordon Summers, both expert riders. It's very comfortable, isn't it, Toby? It is. It's very flat. As you can see, I'm not hardly going up and down at all. And it's a gait that's very comfortable, and you could go all day like this, really. I mean, Gordon, this is your first time on one of these. What do you think? These are fun. It's an extraordinary experience, unlike anything. But Toby's right. I could ride all day and then all night. Medieval tracks were the highways of their day, and travelers encountered all sorts of folk on their journey. A common sight near towns and cities was the pack man, leading a pack horse laden with firewood. The only source of fuel for domestic heat was firewood, and these packmen would bring their pack horses into the towns and into the cities. They were the fuel trucks of the day. In London, around 1300, there was a population of about 80,000. You can imagine the amount of firewood they needed, not just for domestic heat, but to fire the pottery kilns, to fire the bread ovens, and to fire the blacksmith's forges. Convoys of packmen with a lifeline to the city. Whoever he met on the road, the medieval traveller had to reach his destination before nightfall. The medieval forests of this period are, are teeming with bandits. Deserters from the army, men on the run from the law and from their lord have sought refuge in the forest and are, are living desperate men. And they need an income and we make very easy pickings if we're not, uh, if we're not heavily armed. The threat of attack in the Middle Ages was real and people armed themselves as a matter of course. Coming up next, how could a man survive an onslaught like this? I'm going medieval to find out. I've been going medieval to explore the reality of the Middle Ages. It was an age of extraordinary ingenuity and surprises. The stale urine of a man. One myth is that knights were lumbering heavyweights. The truth is the complete opposite. This highly mobile warrior was the product of an arms race that began hundreds of years earlier with an even more flexible form of armor. It was called mail and was a body covering made of tightly interlocked iron rings. But mail was never designed to be worn on its own. It was always part of a layered system of protection. For almost a thousand years, the war gear of the fighting man hardly changed. It was like this. A man is wearing a quilted padded coat called an Akaton. And if he can afford it, over the top, he's got a male shirt. 
but whatever you're doing, this textile armour is the key, isn't it? I mean, this is really what is stopping the impact. It's the... That's the deal with the textile armour, isn't it? It's like, that might turn a blade, give a deflecting surface, but this is what's protecting against the blunt trauma. If I really whack him, that's what's giving you the protection, is this heavily padded undergarment. Male armour was designed to protect a warrior from close-range attack by sword and spear, but it also had to defend against the long-range weapon of the day. The war bow. There was nothing new about archery in battle, but what the makers of male armor were up against was the sheer power of the war bow. This is the English War Bow Society. These are phenomenally powerful bows. The key to this power is the draw weight. The draw weight of a bow is simply a measurement of how many pounds it takes to pull the string to full draw. And Mark draws to 32 inches, and that means this bow is 170 pounds. It takes 170 pounds of muscle power to pull it back to full draw. So how effective were these bows on the battlefield? At the Battle of Cressy in 1346, the English, under King Edward III, fought a French army that outnumbered them by around five to one. Despite overwhelming odds, the English forces won the day. The key to Edward's victory was archers. He took 7,000 archers, nearly half his army, to the battle. Now, if we can conservatively think they could shoot probably 10 or 12 arrows a minute, that means in just a quarter of an hour. They've shot over a million arrows. And this is a battle that went on for hours and hours. That would exhaust arrow stocks very, very quickly. And arrows are extremely sophisticated and expensive ammunition. So what's the best way to use them? Some people believe that in battle, medieval archers shot at long range, maybe even up to 300 yards. I think that's unlikely. There is no medieval piece of art or manuscript that shows archers shooting in an elevation. You don't see them shooting up like that. In battle scenes, they are always shooting directly like that. I think they shot at much closer range, probably at 30 or 40 yards, for maximum thump. But could that impact defeat the enemy's armor? The whole point of armour is that it is defence against the weapons of the day. If it's not, there's no point in the expense or the trouble of wearing it. But if the longbow is such a superb weapon that it can penetrate armour easily, why isn't everybody at Cressy dead within minutes? Of course some people were killed by arrows. Some armour was of inferior quality. Everybody didn't have full armour. Some rash young men would lift a visor. But the arrows generally were repelled by the armour. So what is the military effectiveness of massed archery? It's in the blunt trauma. It's in the thump after thump after thump that people are receiving from these heavy bows. So I want to set up a test to measure exactly how much impact they are receiving. I'm being helped in the test by Dr. Matthew Payne. He's a specialist in contact sport injuries. So, Matt, this is Boxing Bob. Yes, This is who is. you use for testing the power of boxers' punches. It's been mainly calibrated for boxing, punching, kicking with martial arts uh -huh. people. So we will be able to measure the amount of force those arrows are having on the body within. Yep, sensors here will measure force anywhere over that area, and then we can uh, take further measurements and calculations from that. So the first thing we need to do is put on the textile armour. The textile armour that soldiers wore under their mail is designed to absorb and spread the force of a blow. It consists of 25 layers of linen, sewn together and quilted for greater density. So we're putting that over the pressure pad, and then we'll put this riveted mail shirt over the top. He's got big shoulders, hasn't he? 
For the test, both archers are using war bows of 140 pounds draw weight at extremely close range. There we go. The sensors on the dummy will record the force of the arrows and relay the data to a computer. OK, Mark, Joe. Loose. Good shot. Did we get a reading there. Yep. This is not Sunday afternoon archery practice. They're fighting with these bows. 115 pounds. Oh, look at that spike right up there. 300 pounds. 300 pounds, that last arrow. These very, very powerful bows at this extreme short range, just 12 yards, are punching through the male. The male is, however, taking some of the energy out of them and slowing them. But that, if you were just wearing a male shirt, this would be deep in you and you would be dead. However, you can see where it's hitting the textile armor underneath. I mean, certainly not even coming through at all there or there. So while some arrows pierced the mail, none went right through the combination of mail and thick textile armor. But what about the force of the impact? So, Matt, we've got a reading here of 300 pounds. So what's that the equivalent to? If you look at the impulse, the stopping power that's happened, yeah. you've got a value of about 10 newton seconds, which is actually about the mid-range for a 44 Magnum bullet. There's more energy in a gun, but there's not as much. So what damage is that doing to the... I mean, suppose it's on the soft tissue, where, where, where I've got organs inside here. Now, there's a potential for it to do quite a lot of damage. Now, the arrow won't punch the armour, but the armour's working by deflecting and rebounding. If that's going in that far with, with energy, then it's going to cause damage that deep inside the body. Tests suggest that repeated hits from massed war bows would deliver a debilitating onslaught of heavyweight blows. Blows that would soften up and weaken an enemy, sapping his stamina and will. Even when the arrows couldn't penetrate the armor, they were powerful fists with a long range punch. Oh. So armor had to be improved. In response, armor makers began to use solid metal plates in the outer layers. But there was a problem. Armorers were very skilled at working with small plates, but they didn't yet have the technology to produce large, rigid body plates. If you need to cover the torso, you have to find another answer. And the answer was the coat of plates. The coat of plates is a leather or cloth facing that has smaller steel plates riveted onto the inside, which all overlap and can flex and can move. You're protecting a large area with relatively small pieces of metal. And this is good armor, but you can still get weapons through and between the gaps, and it still gives. You know, it still has some flex, it still has some give, so it's not resisting shock quite as well as later forms. Eventually, the armor makers figured out how to make solid breastplates that covered the torso. Now, there was real protection against the war bow. As the metalworking technology is improving and improving all the time, there's slowly more and more iron and steel plate kind of growing over the whole body. But a knight or man at arms wearing this sort of kit could walk with reasonable confidence into an arrow storm. Armor of the day does its job. It's generally proof against the weapons of the day. Yeah, that's the idea. And as soon as it's not, it gets better. By the end of the medieval age, the noble warrior dressed for war in a way we all recognize, the knight in shining armor. Covered from head to toe in steel plate, he was a highly mobile fighting machine. At around 65 pounds, this armor weighed less than the combat load carried by a modern US frontline soldier. The arms race between armor and arrows was over. It would take a whole new kind of weapon to tip the balance again.
Coming up next. War was a knight's occupation, but hunting was his passion. I'm going medieval to learn how an obsession for hunting helped the nobility train for war. I've been discovering some surprising realities of life during the Middle Ages. Now I'm going medieval to uncover the truth behind the great obsession of the noble classes, hunting. Hunting was central to medieval life. All classes of society hunted, but for the nobility, it wasn't just about sport or food. War was a knight's occupation, but hunting was his passion. And it was a passion that helped him prepare for battle. A French nobleman of the time wrote, for every kind of military encounter, hunting is a better training than jousting. Hunting was a highly ritualized and regulated event. It was a very high status event. And for hunting large game, they would gather in the forest at daybreak for a formal breakfast. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Thank you very much, Steve. This is much more than a social occasion, isn't it? It's reinforcing the whole social structure. And you have people of all different social levels, all with their job to do. And on the battlefield, that's tremendously important because an effective medieval army has lots of different types of soldier all working together. A hunt was meticulously planned, combining men, horses, and dogs. Medieval dogs were not like modern pedigree breeds. They were types of dog, bred purely for practical function. The first job was to find the deer, and the hunt master was able to decipher clues left by the animal itself. The harbourer has brought me a dish of deer droppings. Thank you very much indeed. This is the big honour for the master of the hunt to determine from these deer droppings which deer to hunt. And you can actually tell by the form of it, how, how firm it is, they can break it apart and sniff it. A good huntsman will be able to tell whether this is a healthy animal, what age it is, and if it's fit to hunt. The chosen dropping was given to a dog with an incredible sense of smell. These beautiful bloodhounds are very much a medieval type of dog that went to find a particular deer. Their sense of smell is so good, they can actually pick out an individual deer to the exclusivity of all the other scents on the forest floor as well. These dogs, the recon mission, were worked on a leash for which the medieval word was lion. They were known as limers. Once the limers had located the deer, the area was surrounded for a radius of several miles with relays of fast running dogs. We need to give chase, and for that you need, you need some speed, you need a long dog. So we will have a pack following the deer, but the deer can get well ahead of it. Only if the deer got close to the outer cordon were these relay dogs let loose to turn him back towards the main hunt. Their chase reflex is triggered by, by the sight of the prey, and they can reach speeds of up to sort of 45 miles an hour. Incredibly fast dogs. Fast, but only over short distances. They couldn't match a deer for stamina. That's why they were stationed in relays, so that one pair could take over from another. For the main chase, huntsmen used dogs that ran in packs. So these are the bratchets. These are the, the main pack. Off leash, they run as a pack. They've got extraordinary scenting ability. So when we're riding after the quarry on horses, these are the hounds that help us keep in contact. These are the dogs with the stamina and the scent to get after the quarry. the danger, the adrenaline, the camaraderie. It was just like a military campaign. The thrill of the chase was irresistible, and it prepared a man for the rigor of battle. 
A knight aspired to show as much strength and courage and skill on the hunting field as he did on the battlefield. Hunting dangerous game, game that could fight back, held special status. The most prestigious feat of all was to hunt the wild boar. Just imagine that coming at you. 700 pounds of charging, snarling muscle, armed with dagger-like tusks. To face him on foot, they used special boar spears, which had a transverse bar, a crossbar, just behind the head of the spear. The idea was that even if the boar were stuck with your spear, even if you managed to get him, he would have such momentum driving at you that he'd come right up the shaft and still get you. Medieval manuscripts show hunters attacking wild boar with spears. But could you really do it? I'm going to try a simple experiment. I've always been very curious as to whether these crossbars would work. I mean, I kind of think of a 700-pound boar is charging at you. If he gets that far, he's probably going to knock you over and you're still going to get gored. So I've set up a little bit of a test. I'm going to get Adam and Gordon to run at me, and I'm going to see if I can stop them. Do you want to give it a go, guys? See if you can knock me over? Charge! It takes two to hold it. So my rite of passage was to stand there on my own and take that charge. But as long as I had a good companion coming in, thank you very much, then I was saved the indignity of being bowled over by a piece of meat. But it would be a brave man indeed who would face a charging boar that was not first held down by mastiffs. This was another type of medieval dog, bred for just one purpose. Jake is a Sussex bulldog. He's a type of dog that in the Middle Ages would be called a mastiff. The nose is up here, and that means he can hang on to game, hold game, pull it down, and carry on and holding it, and yet he can still breathe until the hunter arrives with his spear or with his sword. Of all the ways a man could hunt, the most noble, the most dangerous, and the most esteemed was to kill the wild boar from horseback with a sword. Once the game had been killed, the knight would personally butcher it in the field. In practical terms, this meant small enough cuts of meat for his servants to carry home. It also meant that Knights were used to the blood and gore of dead animals. It meant that they were familiarized with it, that they weren't squeamish on the battlefield. Bread soaked in blood and toasted over the fire was the favored reward for the hounds. There's good dog. This has been an extremely successful day. We've had that medieval hunting experience. We've had that bonding with the hounds, and we've had that bonding with each other. It was like a military exercise. That is what hunting was about to medieval people. It was a metaphor for war, and it was training for war. Coming up, Fly. I'm going medieval to explore the fascinating world of falconry. I'll work the land medieval style, and later I'll unleash the most powerful weapon of the Middle Ages. I've been going medieval to get as close to life in the Middle Ages as I can. I've helped build castles, trained and fought with swords, and traveled by land and sea. I've experienced the thrill of the chase and tested what it would be like to be attacked by a wild boar.
Now I'm carrying one of nature's swiftest predators on my fist, a falcon. For all the excitement and prestige of hunting dangerous game, the most iconic and by far the most preferred of medieval hunting pursuits was falconry. Fly. For the rich, falcons were their most prized possessions and an opportunity to show off their wealth. There she goes! In 1368, the English King Edward III spent more on his falcons than the entire annual income of his richest nobleman. He also had perches for his favorite birds in his bedchamber. For a good day's hawking, you need several birds. Spare birds were carried on this frame called a cadge, and the man who carried it was called the cadger. Today, we call someone who carries golf clubs a caddy, which comes from the same word. So, Lockhart, you've never actually held a falcon before, no. or well, let's, let's change that. The falcon is wearing a hood to keep it calm and quiet. This is a Lanner falcon, which is called Bayou, and Lanners were very popular hunting birds in the Middle Ages. You just really gently, you can just feel her crop there. Mm -hmm. so, there. You see how full up yeah, she is? Yeah, yeah. And that's because she's been flown and has fed mm -hmm. and is said to be fed up. You can see that little bulge there, she's fed up, which is why she's sitting very quietly and a bird that, that's sort of listless and not very interested in hunting or is simply said to be fed up. That's where we get that expression. We get a lot of expressions from falconry. Mm -hmm. They naturally go to the highest point. Right. You just need to put your index finger behind her and she should step up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hey, see, she stepped yeah, up. Yes. Now pinch that with your thumb. Right, yes, I understand that. Yes. Now you've got her under control. You've got her under your thumb. That's right. where the expression okay. comes from. Okay. And for extra security, I'm going to put the leash, which is attached to the jesses. I'm going to wrap that here. So now you've really got her secure. You've got her wrapped around your little finger. <laughs> How does that feel? That feels great. That's amazing. In a medieval feel to it, it's just, wow. It is. Connects us yeah, from the ground to the, the sky. wild world, yeah. from the ground to the sky, absolutely. Hunting in social groups was important. But food for the table was mostly caught with nets and traps. And sometimes it was a job for the lone hunter. Skilled hunters would use a bow or crossbow. And their great skill is not only having a good aim, but being able to stalk, being able to get close to their quarry. There are several authentic references describing what must have been one of the strangest sights of the medieval world. They actually had stalking horses. They actually looked like this, two men in a horse suit. Do you think this would work? Well, of course it's not attempting to fool anything. But what it does, crucially, is break up the human form. Anybody who's ever ridden a horse into a field will know that, that rabbits are completely unaffected because it's not bipedal, it's not a human, it's an animal. So this is simply a mobile hide to get us close to the game. But I would suspect that when you're on a horse, that apart from the different silhouette, you've also got the smell of the horse. I would think they probably had to scent this to make it work. It's already quite scented enough in here, thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. You could hunt any prey with a stalking horse, but they were particularly good for creeping up on deer. Stop! You can't do that. I beg your pardon. You can't do that. The penalty for disturbing the king's deer is blinding. Yeah, he's right. This is a royal forest. You're allowed to take rabbits and small birds, but apart from that, carrying sharps is outlawed. So an arrow like this is illegal Indeed. in the king's forest. 
which meant that regular people couldn't go hunting to put food on the table. So I don't think I need a stalking horse to hunt rabbits. But thank you very much. Sorry. The hunting rights of the nobility were taken very, very seriously. And the country was covered with forests and chases, places where only the privileged few could hunt. So if they couldn't hunt game, what did ordinary people eat? To find out, I brought my friends together for a medieval feast. Not a royal banquet, but the kind of meal an ordinary person with a bit of land might have on special occasions. Mark Meltonville knows all about medieval food, and I'm going to help him prepare a meal. So we have an enormous fish here, which is going to make a tremendous feast for my friends under your guidance. I'm going to try and cook it. Um, and it's a pike. Yes, the, the, the water wolf, as it's sometimes known. Yeah. You don't often see pike on the menu today, but it was very popular in the Middle Ages. So I think there's a great misconception among people that everybody in the Middle Ages gorged themselves on meat all the time. But of course, meat was relatively scarce. Yeah, for ordinary people, even with quite a bit of money, you can't just kill a cow, because where's your milk coming from? Fish was the mainstay of protein. Yeah. Of course, there was no refrigeration. So unless they lived near the sea, people ate freshwater river fish, which were also bred in local ponds. Ponds can have their water changed. You can have an in and an out, so the fresh water runs through it. The cleaner the pond, the better the fish. So yeah. is there a good medieval recipe? We're going to bake it. The pike is going to be cooked inside a pastry crust filled with herbs, which most medieval people would simply pick from the garden. Is this pastry going to taste good? No. <laughs> this pastry is designed entirely as a cooking pot. The idea is it is our oven dish. They don't have oven dishes yet, so what you do is you wrap something in pastry and that's the cooking pot. So when it's medieval aluminum foil. It is. I actually want it to look reasonably good because not only is it our cook pot, but it's our serving dish as well. While we're baking the fish, the others are tucking into flagons of ale. People drank ale at every meal, including breakfast. It was surprisingly nutritious, and unlike most medieval water supplies, fermenting the ale made it safe to drink. <laughs> right, gentlemen, and here oh, is the piece de la resistance. Wow. We have roast pike. Look at this fish. I would start with a bit of fish. Well, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's, it's lovely. Yeah, I, need, I, need it's try, I need to try a little bit of this. No. It's like, um, actually rather good. I really like this pike. We've got other authentic medieval dishes, including roast mutton, mushy peas, and apples and honey cooked in almond milk. Very sweet. It's really good. Ah, it's lovely. We have got something called arboletti, which is curdled cheese and eggs. Not necessary to everyone's taste. It's probably its appearance that's the uh, most of okay. It's like cottage cheese, really. It tastes like the meat. It tastes better than it looks. <laughs> In an age before forks, there was a strict etiquette when it came to handling food at the table. You simply don't eat with your knife, and forks haven't been invented, but you use the fingers of courtesy, which are these two, so that as you eat the meat, you hide your mouth. Of course, medieval people didn't eat like this every day, but they did have a fairly well-balanced diet to get them through their hard-working lives. So how did they manage to put all this wonderful food on the table? Next, I'll be getting my hands dirty, working the economic powerhouse of the Middle Ages, the land. On my journey, I've done some amazing things with animals. I've ridden a powerful war stallion and sped along on traveling horses. I've put hunting dogs through their paces and I've flown magnificent falcons. The medieval world was teeming with animals. People's lives depended on them and animals all had a job to do. In the countryside, most people kept a pig. They'd have a breeding sow, 
The piglets would go to market, but they'd keep one back to eat themselves. In the fall, they'd fatten it up with a system known as pannage, taking it to graze in common woodland. This is Alex Langlands. He's an expert on medieval farming. Pannage is all about grazing, grazing the woodlands. At this time of year, you'd want to get the pigs out there grazing because it really fattens them up. So what they do is do, see what we're doing here, turning over the forest floor, looking for the beech mast, looking for acorns, cob nuts, all those kinds of things which would feed these throughout these autumn months. Their hunt for food turned pigs into the rototillers of the medieval world. If you want to clear land, the best thing to do it is the pig. And today, we have these big cultivators machine that go in and chew everything up. Well, why use those machines when you can use pigs to do it? It was a very interdependent society. In the same way that nature is interdependent, people mirrored that natural world, yeah. and it all functioned very well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In a deeply superstitious age, pigs were sometimes treated as human. In France, in 1386, a pig was accused of killing a child. It was put on trial, convicted, and sentenced to death by public hanging. <laughs> Flocks of geese were to be found in every village. And like every animal, they had to earn their keep. One of the great things about the medieval world is how everybody shared everything so much. So you might have a, a lowly goose herd with his flock of geese, but he would have an arrangement with a man who owned an orchard. Geese can do a great job here in the orchard. They'll, they'll not only fatten up themselves by keeping the weeds down, but the other thing is bird droppings are famous for their qualities of basically fertilising the soil. And geese are taken to market. And, I mean, trying to push them through this orchard is yeah. hard enough. Every part of the goose would be used. The meat and eggs made excellent eating. Goose fat was used for greasing the bearings on water wheels and the like. And the feathers went into bedding and for making arrows. That is, if you could catch them. Uh, maybe this is a two-man job. <laughs> Medieval people were fighters, builders, hunters, sailors. But it was a world dominated by agriculture. 700 years ago, 90% of the population of Europe lived on what they produced from labouring in the fields. Oxen were the tractors of the medieval age. Ploughing was done with oxen, Alex, uh, very often with very large teams. Uh, on most manors, you know, you'd have teams of up to eight oxen and, and you might bring your oxen along and I'd bring mine along and then the Lord might provide two. In this case, unfortunately, one of the oxen is lame, so we're only going to work with two. An ox going lame could spell disaster when fields had to be ploughed. So it was even more important that the community pooled their resources. The yoke had been around for thousands of years, and medieval people still used this ancient technology for attaching the oxen to the plough. It's a very simple but very effective but system. It's the best way to capitalise on the strength that these animals have in their shoulders. And, of course, the more oxen you've got working, the easier it is on every single beast, the more work you can do in a day. Head up. That's it. Nice and steady. Yeah, steady. Walk on. Get over. Get over. The thing about the oxen, it does need constant encouragement. Get over. Get over. Get over. An extremely important change that happened during the medieval period was a major advance in agricultural technology, the development of the heavy plough. This really is the, the business end of the medieval world for me. This is the heavy plough, and it enables you to cut into these deep clays, stiff clays that, of course, Northern Europe was famous for. Prior to this plough, what you were doing was just scratching the surface. As the technology here unleashes the fertility, and that's the critical thing, because then yields absolutely explode. Population explodes, you've got a massive growth in towns, more cash, bigger towns, and a forward population boom. 
And none of that would have been possible without the brute strength of the teams of oxen that pulled the plough. Medieval land was divided up into strips for individuals to work. There were no fences between the strips, but everyone knew which bit was theirs. But essentially, they'd all be working together in common for the sort of greater good of the field, if you like. Because the ploughman would plough for everybody. Yes, that's right. Ploughing these heavy soils is hard work and was a skilled job. The ploughman would be paid with a percentage of the harvest or with other produce. For everyone else, they lived on what they grew. What you're really looking to do is to get enough cereal to last you through the year, whether it's keeping you in beer or in rye bread or in bread. But also, you've got to set aside enough grain crop to sow the next year as well. Of course. And everyone had to grow enough to pay their taxes to the lord of the manor. The rich grew richer off the fat of the land. The wealth of the Middle Ages is in the soil. It's in the land. It was unleashing the potential of the heavy soils of northern Europe that allowed it to flower during the 13th and 14th centuries and to become the richest place on Earth. By the end of the working day, medieval people were just as dirty as we would be. But did they really smell as bad as you'd think? Or is this just another common myth? I've been exploring the medieval world, both in war and peace. Along the way, I've tried to challenge our ideas about the people and how they lived. One of the most common modern perceptions about the Middle Ages is that everybody was filthy, dirty, and smelly. Now, I'm sure a lot of them were, but you know, a lot of people today are. Personal hygiene is not a question of whether the products are available, it's a question of whether or not you use them. They did have soap. Dr. Catherine Flower Bond is a specialist in medieval domestic life, and she's made these soaps from authentic medieval recipes. So a soap like that, is it expensive or is it available to all stations of society? Or? No, that's available to everybody, that particular soap, because it's made with tallow. Which is so cheap fat. Relatively okay. cheap. Um, but I've also added some stale urine that I've percolated through as well. Which gives ammonia, which is bleach. Yes, that's going to help with your stubborn stains and mm -hmm. collars and cuffs and things mm -hmm. to get the worst of the grime off. Any peasant could make this. Yes, that's relatively cheap to produce. What's even cheaper is one like this, which has just got basic pig fat or lard in. Um, oh, my wife will be astonished to see this. It's certainly hard work. It is. And cold, too. Not a hot water process at all. It's always, always cold, water. cold water. And the thing about the Middle Ages is they had so and ingenious washing apparatus like this. Indeed. So this is called a battle door? It is, or a beetle. And so that's going to force the dirt through the fibres. The process is exactly the same as you're using a modern washing machine. But these are laundry soaps. What about people washing themselves? Well, people soaps, there's a selection here. So you can put roses in it or marigolds or whatever smells you particularly like. And so a little bit more expensive. That's um, really but, nice. Or you could have just a plain bar like this one here. And this is what we would refer to as Castile soap. And but this is reserved for someone of some wealth. Yeah, I can this. feel that's an extremely luxurious soap. And it almost feels like a moisturiser at the same time. Very nice to use. Medieval people didn't ignore their teeth either. Today, Americans spend $2 billion a year on toothbrushes. 700 years ago, they were free. With sticks like hazel, licorice stick, or the marshmallow root, so you see, you chew it, it becomes quite fibrous, really like the bristles of a toothbrush. It's not as soft or as comfortable as my modern toothbrush, but it works. It's, sorry, I've got all the bits on that. <laughs> it's a bit, this is a bit, it's... Shh. Toothpaste came straight out of the herb garden. This is salt and sage. Just yeah. rub it round. Oh, it's quite nice. Oh, I like it. 
The sage mm -hmm. stops bleeding gums and the salt takes all the plaque away. But it wasn't just about having fresh breath and being pleasant socially. That's right. All around you is foul-smelling air and what they perceive to be diseases all around you that you can smell in and ingest inside of you. And so they would make things like these, which are beads, Mm -hmm. pomander beads made from herbs so you go out into the world into new areas the market wherever that smells bad you pick up your beads you warm them in your hands you smell them close and breathe in the fumes and you fumigate yourself against those diseases it's a very strong smell a very powerful smell and it's 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 extraordinary that that was the belief that you could fumigate yourself because they believed that all disease was carried by the miasma, the foul smells in the atmosphere. And if you breathe them in, that's how you caught disease. If fumigating with herbs didn't work, people could go to their local doctor for one of the most bizarre treatments of the Middle Ages. I've done a lot of medieval things in my time, but I've never tried this before being bled by leeches. Rory McCready is an expert in medieval medicine and surgery. Oh, little tickle. That could be it. So, you've just put a live leech on my arm. Yeah. Uh, and I can feel the slightest prick as, as, as he's burrowing in. And this was a basic practice in medieval medicine. Yes. The medieval world believed that your well-being was controlled by four mysterious body fluids called humours. These were black bile, yellow bile, phlegm and blood. Bleeding by leeches was supposed to keep these humours in balance. You would be bled quite frequently. The idea was quite often you'd be bled, keep everything in balance. And that, that would make me feel at ease. Yes, hence you wouldn't be at disease, or the modern word disease, that's where it comes from. Ah, I see. And he, he's getting quite fat now, and of course he's actually injecting an enzyme into me that, that, that thins my blood, an anticoagulant. Yes, the enzymes in leeches are being used a lot now for people who have strokes mm -hmm. to break down the blood clots. But there was one disease that no amount of treatment with leeches or anything else could cure. It was called the Black Death. Between 1348 and 1350, a great pestilence swept over Europe, killing 50% of the population. Cartloads of dead were tipped into mass graves, and they were then stacked into neat piles, five deep. And that's why there were bizarre creatures like this, the stuff of nightmares, to be found stalking the streets and lurking in the houses of the dying. But in fact, it's a doctor. It's a plague doctor. And if we can assist you off with the Thank hood, you. uh, you're really wearing the equivalent of a biochemical hazard suit. Yes. <laughs> Stops all the airs getting through to me, keeps me safe while I'm dealing with the sick and the dying. Because this is waxed, I can feel. It's waxed. And inside, it's quite aromatic. It's quite pleasant smelling. Herbs. Inside is a sausage of herbs mm -hmm. or a sponge that's been dipped in vinegar. And that is supposed to make the air aromatic for me to breathe and safe for me to breathe. So this is what I'd wear to protect myself when visiting the sick and the dying. I mean, all I can do is give some medicines which I give with my long spoon to keep far away as possible. So you're, you're standing off at That's a distance. Right. I mean, how much chance did a plague victim stand if you came to attend them? Not much. Not much. Absolute awful way to go. Spread by fleas carried on rats, the plague put its victims through a horrible death. Black, foul-smelling lumps appeared all over the body. Within a few days of the infection appearing, most people died in agony.
The Black Death was the great failure of medieval medicine. They didn't understand where it came from, and they didn't understand how to treat it. It was a failure that ultimately led to the end of the medieval world. The plague may have wiped out half the population, but it didn't put a stop to war and aggression. Next, I'm going to unleash the fury of the medieval world's most powerful war machine. This is the big moment. I've gone as close as possible to the medieval world to experience how people dealt with hygiene, health, and terrible disease. I've gone medieval to help build a brand new castle. Now I'm going to find out how to knock one down. This is the big moment. Stone castles were built for defense. The massive walls of the castle being constructed here at Guédelon in France are 12 feet thick, proof against almost every form of attack. But there was one weapon that could bring down even the strongest castle walls. It was called the counterweight trebuchet, and it was a giant siege engine. Trebuchets were given nicknames. The fearsome engine that Edward I took to the siege of Stirling Castle was called Warwolf. Another popular name was Malvoisin. It means bad neighbor, and trebuchets were certainly that. Fire in the hole! That must have gone at least five or six hundred yards. Let's load up and do it again. These enormous machines could hurl massive stones to smash into a castle wall up to a mile away. At the medieval center in Denmark, they've built a full-size working replica of a trebuchet. And here's how it works. Men walking inside two tread wheels wind up a rope which pulls the long arm of the trebuchet down and lifts the counterweight up. When the arm is released, the counterweight drops, flinging the arm and its deadly load up and over. Edward I's trebuchet, Warwolf, was so huge, it took five carpenters and 50 men three months to build. With ammunition calibrated to the same size and weight, the trebuchet was deadly accurate. You could hit the same piece of castle wall again and again, weakening it until it was breached. Imagine that, day after day after day. This great hopper holds up to 10 tons of stone, and I've got to help lift it. This is really quite exhausting work. I'm sure there are many ways of measuring energy. Joules, watts, all sorts of things. But there's nothing like measuring the power of this great machine than walking it in. Every muscle feels every ounce of energy that we've pulled back here. A battle-hardened team could raise the counterweight in 15 minutes. That meant a constant bombardment of stones all day. And all night, too. Stones weren't the only thing used by trebuchets. They were also used to hurl the rotting carcasses of dead animals to spread disease within the castle. They were used to throw beehives. They were used to send home the decapitated heads of enemy prisoners. They were used as terror weapons. But most terrifying of all, they were used to throw great fireballs. Look at that. There's the roar of flame through the sky. 
and these balls would crash through the castle roofs, crash into the wooden structures, the stables, and all the buildings within the courtyard, and set the whole place ablaze. The castle's defenders often had to be prepared to wait it out for a long time. Most of medieval warfare was siege warfare, and that you had to be able to withstand for months if necessary. The single most important thing about a castle is having a water supply within the walls. Many castles would have two, three wells. You could withstand a siege for weeks, maybe months, with very little food. But you could only go days without water. In the 1400s, Harlech Castle in Wales was besieged for seven years, the longest siege in British history. But the soldiers behind a castle wall weren't defenceless. If the enemy got within bowshot, defenders could shoot out of the long, narrow slits built into the walls. These are called arrow loops, and I'm going medieval to try out an idea that I've had about how best to use them. If you've got men rushing at your walls, you need to shoot as many as possible, and so you can work in teams like this, two of you operating against one loop. It also gives the impression to the enemy that you've got greater forces than you have. You may think it's strange that we're shooting from such a distance, but there's two reasons for that. I can't stand this close to it because my bow limbs will slap. But there's another reason I have to stand back, and it's called the archer's paradox. When an arrow leaves a bow, the force of the string behind it bends it around the bow. In fact, what happens is it bends as much as that, and then it whips back to bend the other way. And for the first 12 or 15 feet, it's making this serpentine progress. And this is what it looks like when slowed down 150 times. As it snakes through the air, it takes about 15 feet before this arrow straightens out. So from here, I actually have to work back until I'm shooting straight. Of course, a slit that lets arrows out can also let arrows in, though they were a harder target. And it doesn't really matter whether the arrows go through cleanly or if they just rattle against the wall. The archers inside that arrow loop are going to be quite intimidated if there's a couple of archers out here shooting in at them. The noise inside with metal-headed arrows would be very frightening indeed. Sometimes the attacker's hand would be forced. What happens if I need to take this castle in a hurry? For instance, if there are reinforcements on the way, if the enemy has got more troops coming and I need to get in, I need to get in quick. These walls look pretty intimidating, so my options are limited. One of the most desperate and certainly one of the most dangerous ways to take a castle was by escalade, going in over the top of the walls. Sometimes they would build elaborate siege towers, but more often than not, it was just a question of brave men and ladders. It was an extremely hazardous business. There'd be people dropping rocks on your head, and there's also archers who can shoot at you from the side. But you've got to keep going. You've got to get up that ladder. There are men behind you. When you get to the top, you're not going to get a friendly welcome. People are going to attack you. And that now becomes problematic for me. I'm hanging on to the ladder with one hand, and I've got my shield in the other hand becomes very difficult for me to draw my sword. It's awkward. Maybe I can get a dagger out quicker. 
But that probably doesn't intimidate you too much, does it? No, I mean, I can thrust you, loot, take you yeah. out the way, and then smash you off the wall. The glaring option for me here is to try and push this ladder away from the wall. But I can't move it. There would be 15, 20 beefy soldiers on this ladder behind me. This is an immense weight against the wall. In order to get it off, you'd need tremendous leverage. You, you'd, you'd, you'd need a lever, you'd need a bar. I, I, need, I need a bar and I need 10 burly men to exert their influence against that. But that's going to tie up 10 of, of vital defenders. So my job is not so much to get over. My job is to take my time, get my sword out, and hold you into position. Hold you where you are. Keep you fighting back and occupied. But even if you manage to scale the walls and get into the castle, the defenders still had one last trick in store. So I've got over the outer defenses. I've got over the wall. I've rammed through this iron shod door, and now I'm in this very small chamber in the last bastion, in the keep of the castle. But there was no limit to the ingenuity of the castle designers, because above me is a murder hole. That is not going to be fun on your head. He can be armed with hundreds of stones up there. You can get only four or five men in here. You can just pick them off. However big that army is, you can defeat them at this last position. Castle designers were innovative, but weapon designers were equally ingenious. Coming up, the firepower that helped blast away the Middle Ages. I've been going medieval to tackle our misconceptions of the period and to experience medieval life for myself. Now I'm going to look at one medieval invention that changed the nature of warfare forever. For most of the Middle Ages, wars were fought with sword and spear, lance and arrow. But in the 14th century, an invention arrived in Europe which would change all that. The gun. The first guns in Europe looked like this and were this size. And this, in fact, is a replica of the Lossold gun, the earliest archaeologically excavated gun in Europe. It may not look much, but this little gun was a turning point in medieval warfare. Weapons expert Jens Christensen is helping me load. What's surprising about the first gun is it didn't shoot a cannonball. The first ammunition that was used was this, an arrow. And if you think about it, it's not really that surprising because if you've never seen a cannonball, why would you think that's the first ammunition to use? And I use a mallet to make sure that's pretty good. Medieval gunners were considered unchivalrous, and they were threatened that if captured, they would have their hands cut off and their eyes plucked out. OK, I'm going to go and light it. Right on target. We got a shot. The arrow has broken somewhere. It, it, it's... The, yeah, for, the force of hitting that has shattered this off. One of the earliest records of guns being used on the battlefield in Europe was when the English brought them to bear on French forces at the Battle of Crecy in 1346. The thunderous explosion, the sulphurous smell, the spitting flame struck terror into the enemy. Chronicler of the time wrote, they made a noise like thunder and caused much loss in men and horses.
Every historical period comes up with ideas that last and ideas that fade. From the start, the gun was destined for success. Within 50 years of the first primitive guns, medieval armorers were building weapons that look very like the cannon we know today. One of the first things was they got rid of the arrow and went to the cannonball. First cannonballs were stone like this. They were chipped away by masons because we hadn't discovered cast iron. Europeans didn't discover cast iron until late in the 15th century. The other thing that happened was they went to longer barrels. But how did they make a long iron barrel like that without being able to make cast iron? The answer was using the technology of a barrel. You see these staves in a barrel, these wooden strips that are bound together by these hoops. That's what's going on here. Underneath these rings are staves of iron butted together like that. They're formed around a wooden core. And then these rings with their long flanges are hammered over. Wooden cores burned out, and you've got the barrel of a gun. It's called a barrel because it's the same technology as a barrel. That thing that looks like a beer tankard is called a breech pot. What happens is the cannonball goes in here, the powder goes in the breech pot. He will then put the air seal of that by putting in a wooden tampion. That's going to push the ball up the barrel. Fire in the hole. That's done. Knock out the breech. That's now ready to shoot again. While Lienz is loading, my job is to swab this. A wet swab. There may be sparks in here, and I don't want to put live powder in there until those sparks are killed. That one's ready for loading. Fire in the hole. And so there they go. Bang! After bang! After bang! The age of artillery had arrived. The arrival of the gun was one of the signals that the medieval period was passing. It changed the course of warfare and civilization for all time. Going medieval has been an incredible journey. I've helped build and attack medieval castles. I've plowed with oxen and tasted medieval food. I've hunted with hounds and fought with swords. I've traveled on ships and horses, and I've seen a great, gaudy slice of medieval life. Medieval folk didn't think of themselves as ye olde or primitive or people that dressed up in funny clothes. They considered themselves modern. They used the latest technologies and they wore the finest fashions. People in the Middle Ages were much more like us than they were different from us. In fact, the truth is, they were us. And for me, the real thrill and enchantment of history is in connecting with the physical experience of the world they lived in. And going medieval has helped me enter that world and share a little of their lives. <laughs>